A beggar on a lonely road one day, a strange occurrence took place as you will see. The beggar fell upon his knees and he cried, oh pardon me, I am unworthy in thy presence to be. But the king looked at the beggar and he said, you've been set free. Your sins are all forgiven now and you're born in royalty. So the king and the beggar walked off arm in arm. You see, that king was Jesus and that beggar was me. He who was rich became so poor that a beggar rich might be. The Son of God became the Son of Man. That we poor fallen sons of men, the sons of God might be. I can't explain it, God's wondrous saving plan. But the king looked at the beggar, and he said, you've been set free. Your sins are all forgiven now, and you're born in royalty. Born in royalty, and so the king and the beggar walked off arm in arm. You see, that king was Jesus, and that beggar was me. That king was Jesus, the king of kings, and that beggar was me. Thank you for that song. I don't know if you know that, but when I was a very young Christian back in the dark ages, that was one of my favorite songs that people sang. Thank you for that. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter number four. Galatians chapter number four. As you find that, if you are able, in honor of God's word, please stand, and we'll read the first five verses. Galatians chapter number 4, verses 1 through 5. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Please join us now as we look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless your word as it goes forth today, as we consider the wonder of the birth of our Savior. We ask that you would... Uh, open our minds, open our hearts to understand just what it is you have done for us. How great of opportunity each of us have to come to know Jesus Christ as Savior because of your plan, because of your timing, because of the wonder of the birth of our Savior. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we started the day off with the children's Christmas program, so I guess we can continue with that, that theme. My only question is, where did everybody go? Was in the front rows? Uh, something happened back there. Okay, one person's going to admit it. That was Penny, thank you. Her daughter-in-law got caught. As I walked down her, she said, I'm moving to the back row. And I caught her, so I don't know uh, about that family back there. Regardless, we're glad you're here and enough foolishness. The children's Christmas program kind of points us to the fact that we're approaching that time called Christmas. 
the very special time that we recognize that Jesus Christ came into the world for a purpose, with a plan of redemption for all of us. And as that day draws closer, when we celebrate his birth, our minds turn and should turn uh, to the thoughts of the glorious time when God became a man. Christmas is more than Christmas presents and Christmas trees and lights and decorations. Truly, the Lord wasn't born in December, but he was born. And he came to die for men and women. And when we think of the Christmas story, we think of the reason for him coming, we generally turn to one of the four Gospels, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to find the story. But we're going to look at it a little differently here. This morning I want to consider just two verses, verse 4 and 5, of your text from Paul's epistle to the Galatians. And it captures the wonder and presents the message of Christmas uh, given us. And it gives us the when, the how, and the why. So the first thought to today is, is the when, uh, which is the fullness of time. When Jesus came into the world. Now, the first part of this uh, uh, chapter talked about a son that was an heir. But he did not receive that until the father's appointed time. And then it goes in and says, in the fullness of time, in other words, it wasn't accidental. God's timing was not accidental. It came with a purpose. Paul makes it clear that God had an appointed time. Now, Israel, for centuries, had been looking for the Messiah. They were looking for him to come to redeem them and to be their king. But it didn't happen in their time. It happened in God's appointed time. We today have something a little bit similar. We're looking for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ for his church. And I think it's very soon. But I can tell you it's in God's appointed time. I can't rush him and I cannot delay him. He will do things according to the schedule that he has already for us. So this wasn't an accident and, and Paul makes it clear that there was a time appointed. We must remember that there are no accidents with God anyway. Nothing just happens. Everything is according to God's timetable. You and I sometimes start thinking, say, oh, I think we'll do this. And then we act on that thought. But that's not the way God operates. God is clear in his thinking and has a plan for everything, and it is in his full time that it comes to pass. Now, nothing that I am, have interest in, and I almost hate to use the name, but occasionally when stupid things come out, I read them just so I know what we're talking about. And there was an opera years ago called Jesus Christ Superstar. Anybody heard that one? Shame on you. <laughs> you heard the name. I know what you did. I'm, I'm just being nasty. But Judas in that asked the question, why did you use, uh, choose to come right now? Well, we know that God is not premature in revealing himself in the flesh to man. Some 2,000 years ago, he did it in the fullness of time. It was his time that he chose. It was his time before the foundation of the world that the plan came. He wasn't late. He wasn't early. 
He was right on time. Well, the time was right culturally for the Lord Jesus to come. In the third century before Christ, Alexander the Great captured the world and with it brought the Greek culture and language. The Greek culture broke down some barriers of nationalism so that people from one nation could more easily accept the ideas of someone from another nation. In other words, it kind of meant uh, uh, some things that were going to happen. For example, when Christians, the early Christians would travel from one country to another with the message of Jesus Christ, they were more readily accepted. Another important aspect of the Greek culture was the language. The Greek language became the commercial language of the world at that time. It was then much as it is with English today, the second language spoken by most all people. Go to most any country in the world and the second language will be English. It is taught in school. So the time was right culturally. They were willing to accept ideas from other uh, places, but also they could speak a language that others could understand. It made it possible for the scriptures to be read and for the scriptures to be understood by all. Truly, when Christ was born, it was the fullness of time culturally. And it was the right time politically. During the century before Christ was born, the Romans took control of the divided territories that Alexander had conquered. With the Romans, control came, and then they built roads, roads to connect the commercial centers. And with the Roman law came protection for Roman citizens and freedom to move from one country to another. So when the Apostle Paul and others preached the gospel, they were able to travel on semi-paved roads with privileges never known before. Remember, Paul was a Roman citizen. When Christ was born, he was born in the fullness of time, political. Then the how? God sent his son, made of a woman, under the law. Christ was made of a woman, according to what Paul wrote in our text. This statement confirms the gospel accounts of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ in Matthew 1, Luke 1, in those gospels. Christ's birth of Mary also fulfilled many Old Testament prophecies about how he would be born. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 uh, suggests that the virgin birth uh, suggests the virgin birth in the speaking uh, of a Messiah because it says he would be the seed of a woman, not of man. Man is not mentioned in there. The curse was there. The redemption comes from the seed of a woman. Now, you and I know, I believe, that, that she, what she conceived, that Holy uh, Spirit uh, brought into her the Son of the Lord, Je uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, to be born. Isaiah 7 and 14, verse 14, specifically tells us that the birth will be a virgin birth. It prophesies that. As a child in human form, he was born, but as a son in the likeness of his father, he was given. Listen to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us is born, a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Christ was made under the law. 
his coming fulfilled the promises of the law. As the scripture tells us here, he was made under the law. His coming fulfills all the promises. Now, the great hope of the law was that the lawgiver was going to come. Genesis 49 and verse 10 says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So Christ's coming fulfilled the promise. His coming fulfilled the precepts of the law. All the letter and all the spirit of the law were fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. His coming results then in the payment of the penalty of the law. You see, under the law, and if you're trying to get to heaven by doing some good things, by good works, you've got a real problem. Under the law, no man could be made right. No man could be sinless. And yet that's a requirement for heaven for us. So Jesus came to fulfill and to pay that penalty for us. Hebrews 10 and verse 10 says, By the which will we uh, are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So when we read the scripture, we, we learn that Jesus came and he died. He paid the penalty for our sin, for your sin, for my sin, for the sins of the whole world. Now, all of God's promises are conditional. Salvation is offered, but it has to be received. Though the penalty is paid, and Jesus Christ paid that penalty, you have to receive that payment. You have to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. You have to be born again. But death, uh, Christ's death on the cross paid the penalty of sin that was assigned by the law. And that was death. I'm so glad that God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, we see the when and we've seen the how, but now let's think about the why. Why did he come? Why did Jesus come to this earth? Was it so we could give gifts to each other? So we could have Christmas trees? So we could decorate with lights? Well, you know, that's foolish, isn't it? And yet, to some, that's all Christmas is. To many, that's all this season is about. We forget that Jesus is the reason for the season, as someone else has said. He is the reason. So the first thing that we think about, it says, he came to redeem that we might receive the adoption of sons. He came for the redemption of sinners. Now, who is a sinner? Let me ask you, have you ever sinned? Have you ever lied? I think I can stop there. I don't have to name any others. The person who would raise their hand and say, I've never lied, is the liar. So the truth is, how many sins does it take you to, to be a sinner? 
just one sin. Well, that's, you'd say, well, lying is a minor thing. I'm not so bad, that's all I did. It's not the quantity or the quality of the sin, if you want to use that term. It is the fact that by nature and by practice, you and I are sinners. And we can do nothing about it. I can't and you cannot, but let's hypothetically think for a moment that from this point on, I'm going to do everything that Scripture tells me to do. I'm not going to do anything that it tells me not to do. I'm going to live a perfect life. Guess what? It's too late. You've already sinned. You've already failed. You're already under the curse. And it doesn't matter that you, you clean your act up. The fact is, sin cannot enter the presence of God. So how did Jesus accomplish this? If he came to redeem those of us under the law, that we might become the sons of God, how did he accomplish that? Well, listen to what Peter has to say. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible, corruptible things, such as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish, without spot. Peter says, we can do this only by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not by silver and gold, not by doing good things, not from uh, the traditions that are passed down from our fathers, but it is with the blood of Jesus Christ, shed as a lamb without spot or blemish that we might redeem, receive the adoption of sons. Now, to be a son of God means that there's a new nature. Things are changed. To be a son of God means there must be some regeneration to give you that new nature. To be a son of God means that there is a new standing before God, and that's justification. So the new nature is regeneration. The, the standing is justification. And to be a son of God means a new identification as being part of God's family. That's sanctification. To be adopted as a son means we can never be disowned, never lose our position, never lose our security. Now, the term adoption here is important because it meant that you could never deny that son. He was more yours than if he was born into your family as far as the law was concerned. And so the scripture tells us that we receive the adoption of sons. Now, you hear the term th thrown about from time to time. Well, we're all the children of God. Well, we're all offspring of his creation. That's true. But only the born again. Only those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ can truly call themselves sons of God. That is you and I, if we have trusted Christ as our Savior. Look at verse 4 and 5 again. Now, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Think about that for a moment. We were under the law. There are only two kinds of people in this auditorium and in, on this planet. 
Those who are under the law are those who are under the blood. If you choose not to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, that leaves you only one position. To be under the law and the curse of the law is death because of our sin. Can you name the time that you were born again, that you were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ? Do you really even come close to knowing the blessedness of sonship, being the son of God? And if, if you're saved, and we have that title, we have that position, we're set apart for that. But do you even really comprehend what it means to truly be a son of God? That should make a total difference in your life. We should reflect what God wants us to be. Our lives should reflect his character. We have a position now in Jesus Christ as a son. But today, so sad to say, many, many Christians have forgot what it means to be a son of God. They've gone their own way in the world. You can use whatever term you want. Backslidden is a term that's often used. But the reality is we are of royal blood. We are a child of the king. And we should live like a child of the king. So whether you're saved or lost, why not come today and truly find the fulfillment of Christmas in your life? If you reject Jesus Christ, you are rejecting all that Christmas is really about. You're turning your back on the whole reason for Jesus coming. Now, I enjoy all the frills of Christmas, personally. Some people don't, and that's okay. I have no problem with that. I enjoy it. But I want you to know, that's not what Christmas is really about to me. Those are some things that we, we enjoy as family and friends, but Christmas is about Jesus coming at the right time, the right way, for the right purpose for us, and us responding to that. We have to decide as Christians, will I honor Christ with my life this Christmas season? Do you and are you? Remember, that he was born of a virgin, that he came to redeem us, that we might be the sons of God, and that it was all in accordance with God's timing, with God's purpose, and God's plan. Today, do you know him? Have you trusted him? Are you living for him? Are you walking with him? Are you sharing the good news to those around you about him? We have to examine ourselves. If we're going to have the right Christmas spirit, years ago I preached a sermon, not about a white Christmas, but about a right Christmas. We need to have a right Christmas this year. You need it. Your friends need it. The world needs it. Let's have a right Christmas. Start by knowing Jesus Christ as Savior, being born again, having your sins put under the blood of Christ, and then by living for him. 
this Christmas season. Let's stand together for prayer. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, just a couple simple questions before we have an invitation hymn. How many this morning can say honestly, preacher, I know what it means to be redeemed. I understand why Jesus came in the fullness of time to redeem because he redeemed me. I've trusted him as my savior. How many this morning would just be honest enough to raise their hand and say, preacher, pray for me. I'm saved. I know it. But I want to live for him. Just raise your hand. Thank you. How many could not raise their hand and would say, Preacher, I want you to pray for me. I, I, I've never been saved. Uh, my sins are not under the blood of Christ. I've not been born again, but I want to be. I want to do what God wants me to do do. I want to be what God wants me to be, but I can't do that till I've been adopted into the family of God, until my sins have been covered by the blood of Christ, and I need to be saved. Would you please pray for me? God's speaking to my heart about that this morning. Just raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call your name. Thank you. I wonder if there's one in that would say, Preacher, I raised my hand that I'm saved, but I'm not living like a true son of God. There's some things that God is not pleased with, some things that need to be changed in my life. Would you please pray for me? God speaks to my heart today. Just raise your hand for a moment. Thank you. Others? Yes. God bless you. Thank you. Another? Thank you. Heavenly Father, as we continue the service with invitation hymn, we ask your blessing today. We thank you. for the great gift that you have provided for each of us. Found in the Lord Jesus Christ, who willingly laid his life down, shed his blood, that we could be redeemed. We ask your blessing upon each person here today that your will be done in their life. Help them to do what it is that you lay on their heart to be what it is that you want them to be to be the kind of person that you would direct in their lives we ask your blessing in Jesus name amen